Lesson 5. Mind Reading and Beyond by William Walker Atkinson. The simpler forms of telepathic phenomena have received the name mind reading, and by some have been regarded as something not quite within the class of real telepathy. This last impression has been heightened by the fact that there has been offered the public many spectacular exhibitions of pseudo-mind reading, that is to say, imitation or counterfeit mind reading, in which the result has been obtained by trickery, collusion, or clever artifice. But, notwithstanding this fact, genuine mind reading is actually a phase of true telepathy. What is generally known as mind reading may be divided into two classes as follows. 1. Where there is an actual physical contact between the projector and the receiver, and 2. Where there is no actual physical contact, but where there is a close relation in space between the two parties, as in the case of the willing game. In the first class belong all cases in which the projector touches the recipient, or at least is connected with him by a material object. In the second class belong those cases in which the recipient seeks to find an object which is being thought of by either a single projector or by a number of persons in the same room. You will notice that both of these classes were omitted from the experiments of the Society for Psychical Research because of the possibility of fraud or collusion. But, nevertheless, the student will do well to acquire proficiency in manifesting this form of telepathy, not alone for its own sake, but also because it naturally leads to higher development. In the case of the first class of mind reading, namely, that in which actual physical contact is had between the projector and the recipient, there has been a disposition on the part of some authorities to explain the whole matter by the theory of unconscious muscular impulse of the projector. But those who have carefully studied this subject, and who have themselves performed the feats of this class of mind reading, know that there is far more than this to it. Those familiar with the subject know that there is a decided transference of thought waves from the projector to the recipient, and that the latter actually feels the same as they strike upon his mental receiving apparatus. The whole difference between this and the higher forms of telepathy is that in this the thought currents generally run along the wires of the nervous system, instead of leaping across the space between the two persons. It is known to all who have conducted this class of experiments that at times there will be experienced a change or shifting in the transmission of the thought currents. For a time, the thought waves will be felt flowing in along the nerves of the hands and arms when, all of a sudden this will cease, and there will be experienced the passage of the current direct from brain to brain. It is impossible to describe this feeling in mere words to those who have never experienced it. But those to whom it has once been manifested will recognize at once just what I mean by this statement. It is a different sensation from any other in the experience of a human being, and must actually be experienced to be understood. The nearest analogy I can offer is that feeling experienced by the person when a forgotten name for which he has vainly sought suddenly flashes or leaps into his consciousness, it is felt to come from somewhere outside of the conscious field. Well, in the case of the thought current the feeling is much the same, only there is a fuller sense of the outsideness of the source of the thought. In order to make you understand the distinction between the two classes of mind reading more clearly, I will say that you may think of one as akin to the ordinary telegraphy over wires, and of the other as akin to wireless telegraphy. It is the same force in both cases, the difference being simply one of the details of transmission. Fix this idea firmly in your mind, and you will have no trouble in always having the right conception of any kind of case of mind reading or telepathy. But, you must remember, there are cases in which there is a combination of both methods of transmission, either simultaneously, or else shifting and changing from one to the other. I will here remind the student that he will learn more by a half dozen actual experiments in mind reading than he will by reading a dozen books on the subject. It is very good to read the books in order to get the correct theory well fixed in mind, and also in order to learn the best methods as taught by those who have had a wide experience in the subject. But the real how of the matter is learned only through actual experience. So, I shall now give you advice and instructions concerning actual experimental work. You, the student, should begin by making yourself a good recipient that is a good mind reader, allowing others to play the part of projector. Later on, you may play the part of projector, if you so desire, but the real, fine work is done by the recipient, and, for that reason, that is the part you should learn to play by frequent rehearsals. I advise you to begin your experiments with friends who are in sympathy with you and who are interested in the subject. 
Avoid particularly all early experiments with uncongenial or unsympathetic persons. And avoid as you would a pestilence all those who are antagonistic either to yourself or to the general subject of telepathy and kindred subjects, as you must make yourself especially sensitive in order to successfully conduct a mind-reading test, you will find yourself particularly susceptible to the mental attitude of those around you at such times, and therefore should surround yourself only with those who are congenial and sympathetic. You will find that there is a great difference between the several persons whom you try out as projectors. Some will be more in rapport with you than are others who may be equally good friends. In rapport, you know, means in vibrational harmony. When two persons are in rapport with each other, they are like two wireless telegraphic instruments perfectly attuned to each other. In such cases, there are obtained the very best results. You will soon learn to distinguish the degree of in rapport conditions between yourself and different persons you soon learn to feel this condition. In the beginning, it will be well for you to try several persons, one after the other, in your mind-reading experiments, in order to pick out the best one, and also to learn the feel of the different degrees of in-rapport condition. Even in cases of persons in whom the in-rapport conditions are good, it is well to establish a rhythmic unison between you. This is done by both you and the person breathing in rhythmic unison a few moments. Begin by counting one, two, three, four, like the slow ticking of a large clock. Have the other person join with you in so counting until your minds both work in the same rhythmic time. Then you should have him breathe in unison with you, making a mental count with you at the same time, so that you will breathe together. Count, mentally, one, two, three, four, as you inhale, the one, two, holding the breath, and then one, two, three, four, exhaling or breathing out. Try this several times, and you will find that you have established a rhythmic unison between yourself and the other person. In the progress of an experiment, if you should find that the conditions are not as good as might be desired, you will do well to pause for a few moments and re-establish the proper rhythmic harmony by this method of harmonious rhythmic breathing. Begin by having the projector select some prominent object in the room, a chair, or table for instance. Then have him take your left hand in his right hand. Raise your left hand, held in his right hand, to your forehead. Then close your eyes and remain passive a few moments. Have him concentrate his mind intently on the selected object and will that you should move toward it. Have him think of nothing else except that object and to will you to move toward it with all his power. Close your eyes and quiet your mind, opening your consciousness to every mental impression that he may send you. Instruct him to think not merely chair, for instance, but rather there go there. The main thought in his mind must be that of direction. He must will that you move toward that chair. After a moment or two, you will begin to feel a vague, general impulse to move your feet. Obey the impulse. Take a few slow steps in any direction that seems easy to you. Sometimes this will take you in an opposite direction from that of the chair, but it will get you going. And you will soon begin to feel that the direction is all wrong, and will begin to be mentally pulled in the right direction. You will have to actually experience this feeling before you will fully understand just what I mean. After some little practice, you will begin to feel quite distinctly the mental direction or will force of the projector, which will seem to tell you to come this way now stop now turn a little to the right now a little to the left now stop where you are and put out your right hand lower your hand move your hand a little to the right that's it. Now you have got it all right. You will soon learn to distinguish between the no, that's wrong thought and the that's right one and between the go on and the come on one, by making yourself completely passive and receptive and obedient to the thought and will impulses of the projector, you will soon act like a ship under the influence of the rudder in the hand of the projector. After you have attained proficiency in receiving the mental impressions and directions, you will find yourself attracted or drawn, like a piece of steel to the magnet, toward the object selected. It will sometimes seem as if you were being moved to it even against your own will and as if someone else were actually moving your feet for you. Sometimes the impulse will come so strong that you will actually rush ahead of the projector, dragging him along with you, instead of having him a little in advance, or by your side. It is all a matter of practice. You will soon discover the great difference between different projectors. Some of them will be in perfect, in rapport condition with you, while others will fail to get into tune with you. Some projectors do not seem to know what is required of them, and usually forget to will you to the object. 
It helps sometimes to tell them that the whole thing depends upon their willpower, and that the stronger their will is, the easier it is for you to find the thing. This puts them on their mettle, and makes them use their will more vigorously. You will soon learn to recognize that peculiar feeling of all right that comes when you finally stand in front of the desired object. Then you begin to move your right hand up and down and around until you get the right feel about that also. When you should place your hand on the place which seems to attract you most, you will find that the hand is just as responsive to the mental force as are the feet. You will soon learn to distinguish between the mental signals up, down, to the right, to the left, stop now, you're right, etc. I cannot tell you just the difference you must learn to feel them, and you will soon become expert in this. It is like learning to skate, run an automobile, operate a typewriter, or anything else all a matter of exercise and practice. But it is astonishing how rapidly one may learn, and how, at times, one seems to progress by great leaps and bounds. Now I shall give you the different stages or steps, which you will do well to follow in your exercises, progressing from the more simple to the more complex, but be sure to thoroughly master the simple ones before you pass on to the more complex one. Be honest and strict with yourself. Make yourself pass the examination before promotion in each and every step. 1. Locations. Begin by finding particular locations in a room, corners, alcoves, doors, etc. 2. Large objects. Then begin to find large objects, such as tables, chairs, bookcases, etc. 3. Small objects. Then proceed to find small objects, such as books on a table, sofa cushions, ornaments, paper knives, etc. Gradually work down to very small objects, such as scarf pins, articles of jewelry, pocket knives, etc. 4. Concealed objects. Then proceed to find small objects that have been concealed under other objects, such as a pocketbook beneath a sofa cushion, etc., or a key in a book, or a key under a rug, etc. 5. Minute objects. Then proceed to discover very small objects, either concealed or else placed in an inconspicuous place, such as a pin stuck in the wall, etc., or a small bean under a vase, etc. The public performers of mind reading vary the above by sensational combinations, but you will readily see that these are but ingenious arrangements of the above general experiments, and that no new principle is involved. As these lessons are designed for serious study and experiment, and not for sensational public performances, I shall not enter into this phase of the subject in these pages. The student who understands the general principles, and is able to perform the above experiments successfully, will have no difficulty in reproducing the genuine feats of the public mind readers by simply using his ingenuity in arranging the stage effects, etc. Among other things, he will find that he will be able to obtain results by interposing a third person between the projector and himself, or by using a short piece of wire to connect himself and the projector, drawing pictures on a blackboard, or writing out names on a slate, by means of thought direction, are simply the result of a fine development of the power of finding the small article the impulse to move the hand in a certain direction comes in precisely the same way. The public driving feats of the professional mind reader are but a more complicated form of the same general principle the impression of direction, once obtained. The rest is a mere matter of detail. The opening of the combination of a safe, though requiring wonderful proficiency on the part of the operator, is simply an elaboration of the direction movement. Some recipients are, of course, far more proficient than are others. But each and every person, any person of average intelligence, will be able to secure more or less proficiency in these experiments, provided that patience and practice are employed. There is no such thing as an absolute failure possible to anyone who will proceed intelligently and will practice sufficiently. Sometimes, after many discouraging attempts, the whole thing will flash into one's mind at once and after that there will be little or no trouble. If you are able to witness the demonstrations of some good mind reader, professional or amateurs, it will help you to catch the knack at once. You will find that these experiments will tend to greatly and rapidly develop your psychic receptivity in the direction of the higher phases of psychic phenomena. You will be surprised to find yourself catching flashes or glimpses of carrot higher telepathy, or even clairvoyance. I would advise every person wishing to cultivate the higher psychic faculties 
to begin by perfecting himself or herself in these simpler forms of mind reading. Besides the benefits obtained, the practice proves very interesting and opens many doors to pleasant social entertainment. But never allow the desire for social praise or popularity in these matters to spoil you for serious investigation and experiment. The second step of development. The student, having perfected himself in the experiments along the lines of the first class of mind reading, viz., where there is no actual physical contact between the projector and recipient, but where there is a close relation in space between the two. Now, the thoughtful student will naturally wish to ask a question here, something like this. You have told us that there is no real difference between telepathy at a great distance, and that in which there is only the slightest difference in the position of the projector and recipient, providing, always, that there is no actual physical contact. This being so, why your insistence upon the close relation in space just mentioned? What is the reason for this nearness? Well, it is like this. While there is no distinction of space in true telepathy, still in experiments such as I shall now describe, the physical nearness of the projector enables him to concentrate more forcibly and also gives confidence to the new beginner in receiving mind currents. The benefit is solely that of the psychological effect upon the minds of the two persons and has nothing to do with the actual power of the telepathic waves. It is much easier for a person to concentrate his thought and will upon a person in actual physical sight before him than upon one out of sight. And likewise, the recipient finds himself more confident and at ease when in the actual physical of the person sending the thoughts and will power. That is all there is to it. When the persons have acquired familiarity with projecting and receiving, then this obstacle is overcome, and long distances have no terror for them. The best way for the student to start in on this class of mind reading is for him to experiment occasionally while performing his physical contact mind reading experiments. For instance, while engaged in searching for an object, let him disengage his hand from that of the projector for a moment or so, and then endeavor to receive the impressions without contact. This should be done only in private experiments, not in public ones. He will soon discover that he is receiving thought impulses in spite of the lack of physical contact faint, perhaps, but still perceptible. A little practice of this kind will soon convince him that he is receiving the mental currents direct from brain to brain. This effect will be increased if he arranges to have several persons concentrate their thoughts and will power upon him during the experiment. From this stage, he will gradually develop into the stage of the willing game. The willing game, quite popular in some circles, is played by one person, usually blindfolded, being brought into the room, in which a number of persons have previously agreed upon some object to be found by him, they concentrating their thought firmly upon the object. The audience should be taught to not only to think, but also to actively will the progress of the recipient from the start to the finish of the hunt. They should will him along each step of his journey, and then will his hand to the object itself wherever it be hidden. An adept in the receiving end of the willing game will be able to perform all the experiments that I have just pointed out to you in the contact mind reading class. In the willing game, you must remember that there is no taking hold of hands or any other form of physical contact between projector and recipient. The transmission of the mental currents must be direct, from brain to brain. Otherwise, the two classes of experiments are almost identical. There is the same willing toward the object on the part of the projectors and the same passive obedience of the recipient. All the difference is that the current now passes over the ether of space, as in the case of the wireless message, instead of over the wires of the nervous system of the two persons. The next step is that of guessing the name of things thought of by the party. I can give you no better directions than those followed by the investigators and the query children, as related in a preceding chapter of this book. When you become sufficiently proficient in this class of mind reading, you should be able to reproduce every experiment there mentioned with at least a fair degree of success. It is all a matter of patience, perseverance, and practice. After you have become very proficient in this class of experiments, you may begin to try experiments at long distance. That is where the projector is out of your physical presence. It makes no difference whether the distance be merely that between two adjoining rooms or else of miles of space. At first, however, nearness adds confidence in the majority of cases. Confidence once gained, the distance may be lengthened indefinitely without impairing the success of the experiments. 
The long-distance experiments may consist either of the receiving of single words, names, etc., or else distinct, clear messages or ideas. Some find it no more difficult to reproduce simile geometrical designs, such as circles, squares, triangles, etc., than to reproduce words or ideas. In long-distance experiments, it is well for the projector to write down the word or thought he wishes to transmit, and for the recipient to write down the impressions he receives. These memoranda will serve as a record of progress and will, moreover, give a scientific value to the experiments. Some experimenters have been quite successful in experiments along the lines of automatic writing from living persons, produced by means of long-distance telepathy. In these cases, the recipient sits passively at the hour agreed upon for the experiment, and the projector concentrates intently upon a sentence, or several sentences, one word at a time at the same time, willing the other person to write the word. The famous investigator of psychic phenomena, the late W.T. Stead, editor of a London newspaper, who went down on the Titanic, was very successful in experiments of this kind. His written records of these are very interesting and instructive. You will, of course, understand that in all cases of long-distance telepathic experiments, there should be an understanding between the two persons regarding the time and duration of the experiment, so as to obtain the best results. Personally, however, I have known of some very excellent results in which the receiving of the message occurred several hours after the sending thus showing that telepathy is in a measure independent of time, as well as of space. But, as a rule, the best results are obtained when the two persons sit simultaneously. Do not rest content with accepting the reports of others regarding these things. Try them for yourself. You will open up a wonderful world of new experiences for yourself. But, Remember always, you must proceed step by step, perfecting yourself at each step before proceeding to the next. End of lesson.